really excellent kind of summary of the uh, many interesting challenges which we uh, face uh, if we try to apply machine learning techniques um, and to some of these large-scale data sets where we have both um, some of a limited past amount of observed data, but then many, many um, potential predictions in the future of how, um, how the climate might evolve over time. I think this, this, uh, this raises a whole um, range of interesting machine learning questions, and I have many more questions I have answers um, from a machine, machine learning point of view at this point. Um, but I think this is, um, I feel like it's a, a lot of potential for, um, for some really interesting collaborations in, in this area. So, um, Emily was first introduced to um, as a deep mind by Dave McKay, who uh, a couple of years ago, um, and he uh, sort of, uh, I think he came to lunch one day and, and, and Emily came along and started thinking about um, you know, potential uh, places where machine learning could be uh, applied to uh, climate data sets, to interesting climate modeling problems, and to um, kind of have the maximum, maximum kind of positive impact for the world. So I should probably talk a bit about DeepMind. DeepMind is a artificial intelligence company with a very broad remit to first solve intelligence and then use it to, uh, to solve everything else and to, to make the world a better place. Um, and I work in the, the applied group in you know, DeepMind, which is very much focused on the, the, the latter half of that mission. Uh, so our goal is to try and take uh, interesting new techniques uh, uh, coming out of uh, DeepMind research and generally in, in research in the, in the machine learning community and apply them to uh, kind of pressing real-world problems. Um, so obviously, I have a of excellent examples of such a, uh, such a pressing real-world problem. Um, DeepMind's general expertise is, uh, is largely in deep learning and reinforcement learning. So um, you may have seen uh, over the last few years, DeepMind uh, initially came to uh, prominence by uh, building a system that could play vintage Atari games by learning to uh, watch the pictures on the screen and the computer program would learn to, uh, would learn to kind of move the, uh, the joystick in different ways and press buttons and, and so on and learn gradually through a process of trying to improve its score in this game how to, um, how to, how to play the game and how to, how to win the game. Um, and this was made possible through um, the application of these, these very, very deep and complicated um, machine learning systems called deep neural networks, which are looking at uh, very, very high dimensional data sets, very, very large scale data, and trying to learn from very, very large amounts of data. Um, <coughs> and now that we have the compute power available to, to, to make use of these, 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 uh, these big models and the, the large data sets available, uh, there's really been, in the last few years, a kind of real um, uh, renaissance in, in, these, in these, 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 these techniques, these, uh, these deep, deep learning techniques using neural networks. Um, so, another uh, recent uh, DeepMind uh, application was, this, uh, was, was applying neural networks to AlphaGo, to, to the game Go, uh, in AlphaGo. Um, and there again, this was learned through a reinforcement learning framework, a combination of a deep learning system and a reinforcement learning framework. Um, now, reinforcement learning works well when you have a simulation that you can, you can use, but um, for the, the case of, kind of real world climate data, obviously, it does that doesn't work quite so well. However, there are still um, a bunch of interesting applications um, which we uh, we actually use techniques uh, we've learned from things like AlphaGo to uh, applying this to some sort of more real-world um, control problems. One of these is in um, <coughs> data center cooling. So uh, the Google data center team um, a little while ago uh, were discussing with us uh, this, this problem of trying to control the cooling um, uh, equipment in the data center optimally. You have lots and lots of different uh, bits of cooling equipment and, and different parameters which you can, uh, uh, you, can, you can use to control them, uh, fan speeds and so on. Um, and they wanted to try and reduce the amount of energy that was required to cool the Google data centers uh, enough to keep, to keep them running effectively, uh, not overheating, but not also using too much energy. Um, and so what we, what we found is that by training a deep neural network again uh, to try to optimize these, uh, these parameters of the data center, we're able to reduce the amount of energy required uh, to cool the data center by up to about 40%. Um, so this is a kind of, you know, a, a nice example of a real world application of these, uh, these deep learning techniques, which was influenced um, directly by the, uh, by the work on, uh, on some of these, uh, these other things like, 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 like AlphaGo and so on. Um, so it now seems like there's, um, 
there's lots of potential here for, for, for these, these client models as well. And I think it's interesting to see what we can do here. Um, we'll start thinking about what, what applications what, what one might be able to, uh, to, 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 to bring to, to bear in this, in this space. So um, here I'm not going to talk about sort of deep work that's going on in DeepMind right now. This is all kind of speculative and things that we, uh, you know, we, we think are, I, I, I personally think are interesting. Um, one thing that you know, seems very interesting from, from, uh, from Emily's talk is, is this idea of the risk-based approach and trying to model probability distributions rather than um, simply model uh, kind of exact outcomes. And I think this is uh, going to be an important, uh, an important consideration. The Bayesian approach is that uh, Emily was talking about um, for, uh, for doing this, and particularly also things like Gaussian processes, um, are very good techniques uh, when you have a uh, sort of a, a moderate size data set and you can use a really sort of robust and um, sort of, um, I guess these Bayesian techniques are trying to extract the most possible information out of, out of, out of a fairly small quantity of data. What we also have in parallel with that is these deep learning techniques which deal very effectively with very, very large data sets um, but do require uh, these, enormous, these enormous amount of data sets to work, these enormous amount of data to work. So the interesting question I think um, is to, uh, for me at least, is, is, is thinking about how we marry up the, um, the relatively small amount of observational data we have. So for example, in the, uh, in the model lower um, example, the, um, uh, the emissions data only go back to 1960 or so. So um, we only have one instance of the real world climate uh, to, 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 kind of, you know, to get to, 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 to observe. And so any observational data, data we have um, the good quality data will only go back to sort of maybe 30, 40, 50 years, and beyond that in the past, we have sort of very limited amounts of, uh, of observation, observational data. So um, these, these Bayesian techniques, these, these kind of techniques which are optimized for small-scale data sets are very um, interesting in, in, in that world. What we also have is climate models, where you have the ability to run these huge computer simulations of the climate of the future, and to do, do this multiple times and, and to have multiple instances of possible future climate scenarios. And that, I think, is where um, you have lots more potential for these deep learning techniques which can make use of the large amounts of, of data and try to find these interesting, kind of you know, perhaps hidden nonlinear correlations between um, kind of, uh, parts of this data set which are perhaps uh, space, separated over in time or in space by, by, by large amounts. So I think the, the interesting challenges from machine learning how we um, marry up these, uh, these, these observational data sets and these, and these um, uh, simulated data sets in the most effective way possible in order to make the most out of those, those sorts of data. Um, so I guess that's the, uh, that's the challenges. I don't really have any, any strong answers for, to, for what we should do next, but uh, we've got a, a very good discussion going on between, uh, between Emily and Scott and Richard Turner, who's also a fellow here at Christ's and uh, the engineering department, and he's been um, looking at uh, and thinking about these problems as well. So I look forward to a uh, continued discussion and uh, hopefully we can kind of uh, start to uh, understand uh, some of these problems in a bit more detail and understand what, uh, what, what the, the approaches should be.